Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Well, another big week, another interesting week, another bad week. Uh, we start off with the terrorist attack it's in New York City and in Minnesota and in New Jersey. Uh, bound to have happen. Uh, the biggest for us was 9-11. New York City has had no such attack since 9-11. Uh, that's good 15 years. Uh, these attacks are bad. What are you going to do? Uh, we are at war. Uh, we have been at war, and this war is going to go on. Uh, I don't know how long. No one seems to know how long. It isn't going to be over tomorrow. It's not like we were fighting Germany or we were fighting Japan in World War II where we had a specific country we could identify. We could identify their troops and their allies. Uh, these are terrorists. They fight by d different means, dirty means, secret means, um, under the table, under the bed. Uh, all we can do is be vigilant. I think New York City did an excellent job. They caught the perpetrator in less than 24 hours. Uh, the speed impressed me no end. Uh, Trump, he's crazy. I'm going to tell you right now, it's wrong the way he is using these attacks for political gain. He, he doesn't make sense to me. You know, like, you know what i do? Yeah, he'd drop an A-bomb someplace, uh, and we'd really be at war. Uh, I can recall when we were fighting Russia. After World War II, Russia was our enemy till about 1989, 1991, the Soviet Republic failed. Had it not been for the little wars here and there, like a Korea, a Vietnam, and so forth, uh, we would have been fighting each other. Russia and the United States with nuclear weapons. Uh, and perhaps this is a better way. We've got to put up with this until we get rid of these terrorists. Uh, and it will happen. Someday it will occur. occur. Uh, again, I think Trump's wrong. Uh, he, he, he would take these, also he would take these terrorists, and I think he'd just hang them or put them up against the wall and have them shot. Uh, we have to remember, this is not the way we do things here. They are criminals. They are wrongdoers. You take them, you arrest them, you put them on trial, and then you execute them. <laughs> you give them the full benefit of the law, because that's the way it is here. We live by rules. We function by rules. And they work, even though we're having hard times in the last 20 years in this country. Uh, our own people seem to be against each other. Uh, this is America. It still is America, though not the way it used to be, but it still is, and we don't want to lose that which we have left. I want to talk about the police for a couple of minutes here. Uh, two interesting situations that have occurred recently. These are hard to – you can't believe what's happening here. Uh, first, what, what happened, what, yesterday? Uh, where was it? Tulsa, Oklahoma. A, a, the police, a police officer shot and killed an innocent unarmed black man who also happened to be a church pastor, I believe 40 years old, father of four, had just left a college class. He was taking some kind of a part-time college course, and he was stopped by the police. One of the police officers was a woman, Betty Shelby. And whatever occurred, whatever happened, <clears throat> excuse me, is on tape. It was all videoed. It was videoed by the cameras in the police cars. It was videoed by the cameras on the police officers. And it was also videoed by a police helicopter flying over the scene. When this guy was shot, his arms were in the air. He was not running away. He was not lunging at the police officers. He was waiting for them to tell him what to do next. This is what the videos show. They show this. And after the shooting, and this is terrible, this is, this is, they shot him as the worst, but almost as bad after the shooting, it was like they didn't care about the victim, and he was a victim. He's down on the ground. The police appeared to show no interest in him, no concern. No one ran over to give him first aid. Uh, it was a few, several minutes went by before anyone even went over to take his pulse to make sure he, whether he was dead. The officers and this is what the cameras show, appear to be more concerned with the female police officer. Again, it was a woman, Betty Shelby, 
Must be the first time she ever shot anyone. I'm sure the first time she ever killed anyone. Uh, And she was discombobulated at the moment, and they were more concerned with her than the black man lying on the ground. The police officers in the report said there was a gun. As it turns out, no gun is visible in the video. This morning, the chief of police for Tulsa, Oklahoma, put the gun uh, situation to rest. He said there was no gun involved. The man shot did not have a gun. This stuff's got to stop, my friends. Now we go. I think, you know, I can see what this woman did. She was probably nervous. You know, she her adrenaline was flowing. She may have thought she saw something she didn't. And today, everybody's going to kill a police officer, they feel, so they got to kill first. Another police situation showing the stupidity of sometimes of members of the force. And I recognize that all these events are by the bad apple in the basket, but we got too many baskets with bad apples the last couple of years. Uh, We're talking now, we're in Milwaukee, where the police accidentally shot a 13-year-old elementary school girl, 13 years old. Uh, This is at Thoreau Elementary School in Milwaukee. The police have been called to to, uh, question some people uh, about some incident that happened several days ago, and this girl was being uh, examined or interviewed, questioned about her possible involvement. I, I think they believe she might have committed a robbery or something. And the police officer said that uh, the girl became un- uncooperative and that she became combative. This is a 13-year-old girl. There are several police officers are involved. And that when she became un- combat- combative and they tried to calm her down, one of the police officers' guns gun discharged accidentally. And the bullet grazed her head. Uh, Now, you have to understand, there's humor to this. The firearm discharged while it was still in the officer's holster, snapped into the officer's holster, and somehow it went off and the bullet hit the girl, okay? Now, the gun was a, the police officer had, was a Smith & Wesson M&P .40 pistol. I am not familiar with guns. I've never even held one in my hand. But it was that uh, Smith & Wesson M&P .40 pistol. It has many safeguards on the gun itself, and the holster has safeguards on it. It is absolutely impossible from everything I have gone over today for that gun to have discharged unless it was out of the holster, okay, and certain other safety features were taken off the gun. The Official account by the police officers does not make sense. They refer to it as a freak occurrence. The gun went off. But this gun, from everything that I've been able to see on the Internet, it's impossible to go off when I was in the holster. Uh, And even if it's out, a couple of things have to be done before the gun is fireable. So this freak occurrence doesn't sound like one. The police officers, the police report, describe it as an incident. And the police authorities, the head of the police department in Milwaukee, said, we are not even considering this an officer involved in a shooting. Okay, They claim it was an unintentional discharge. Unintentional discharge. So the police officer is not responsible and has not been removed from duty. And I don't know what type of investigation is going on, but I think by the time this thing is properly investigated by outside authorities, uh, what I have told you about the impossibility of events here will be the true case. Banks are whores. I have consistently taken the position that banks are whores. Uh, I, I, I can't believe they screwed us in 2008. Uh, because they were pigs with the mortgages and bundling them and everything else and selling them as stocks and not paying attention to quality mortgages or anything else, we had the recession of 2008, the worst recession since 1929. At the same time, millions of people had lost their homes, went into uh, mortgage foreclosure, and in effect, most people, what you have is your home. Where the one thing in life that is secure is you pay your mortgage, and at some point you own your home. 
How many people, millions of people have lost their homes because of bank wrongdoing? Nobody ever pays for this. No one goes to jail from the banks. Here's what happens. We fine everybody. Make them pay civil penalty. Well, the United States Department of Justice announced yesterday that a $14 billion fine, not even a million, a $14 billion fine uh, has been levied against the Deutsche Bank. It's a German bank. It's one of the largest banks in the world. Now, you recall, it, what was it, last week, 10 days ago, that our same United States Department of Justice uh, advised us that Wells Fargo had been fined and agreed to pay a $185 million uh, civil fine for their wrongdoing in duplicating 2 million accounts where the customer did not know. Obvious fraud being perpetrated. I thought that was a lot of money, $185 million. Hell, here we got the Deutsche Bank being nailed for $14 billion. Uh, and you know what they are, their government's going after them for the United States government? For the 2008 mortgage crisis, they are the ones who caused it by misleading investors regarding value and quality of the of mortgage-backed securities sold before 2008. Uh, Douche can afford to pay for billions of dollars, I assume, again, because it's one of the world's biggest banks. And banks today aren't hurting. They have not been hurting. We bailed them out. I don't know if Douche needed bailing out. It probably did. We bailed the banks out. And everyone around the world, except for Iceland, bailed the banks out. And the banks came out looking good. And now they're king of the hill again. And it's king of the hill. They're doing everything wrong. They're still screwing the public. They're perpetrating frauds. They don't care what they're doing because they know they can get away with it. I have said, on my television show several years ago, on my podcast, in my writings, on the show, I have said, put some bankers in jail. You know, they're not too big to fail. They are not too big to prosecute. We have set the banks on a pedestal in this country, our government, and said so we can't go after them because we, if we go after them criminally, they may topple. And if they topple, it may cause a national recession or an international recession. The economy will fall. It will fail. Uh, God damn it. Excuse me for swearing. If we indict a couple of bank senior officers, CEOs, and whoever else is up there that did wrong, arrest them. Charge them criminally. Forget the fine. Charge them criminally. And when they're found guilty, let them do several years in jail. This, this stuff will stop. No one wants to go to jail, especially the wealthy, and give up five, six, seven years of their life for wrongdoing sitting in a cell. So uh, that's what we got to do. And if we ever start doing that, this crap will stop with regard to the banks because they're still cheating everyone. They are still cheating everyone. Now, I also think that in our government's mind, at least, there's something as, as to their thinking is why pursue this whole thing with a fine? And that is any money they collect goes into the general fund of the United States. And that money helps to run our government. Our poor government that is what? Uh, $1.9 trillion in, in debt, and it keeps going up. Well, we can use $185 million here and maybe $14 billion there to help keep us going in these hard times. It's all a crock, my friend. you got to put them in jail. Let me say this to you also uh, with regard to Douche Bank. The government said we're going to fine you $14 million. They also said we are willing to negotiate with you, however, as to the amount of the fine. Come on in. Let's sit down and talk. I am of the impression, I am of the belief that banking has become a criminal enterprise in the United States. Strong words. But what they're doing is strong. My God, they're stealing. They're doing everything wrong, and they get away with it. It has become a criminal enterprise. Banks are thieves. Uh, I, I think the banks of today are the mafia of the 21st century. The banks today can be considered the mafia of this century. 
Okay, they get away in effect with murder. Look at the Wells Fargo situation, the 185 million. Our Congress is having a full committee meeting tomorrow in Washington to examine, to question the CEO of Wells Fargo and some other people involved because they want to know why Wells Fargo opened 2 million phony accounts and credit cards over a period of several years when customers did not authorize this. This is horrible. And our Congress, our Congress representatives, 15, 20, whatever the number is on this committee, they're going to tell that banker, you did a terrible thing. How could you people even conceive of this? My God, I don't believe it's happening. And yet they'll do nothing about it. We'll have a couple of hearings. The thing will die. Do you think this Congress, okay, is going to pass laws to punish these people? Our Congress is owned by the big banks and the corporations. They get lobbying dollars big time. Nothing's going to happen, and that's the problem. Nothing happens. I'll tell you, wait till, I, I don't know what they're going to say, the, the CEO from Wells Fargo. Forget the $185 million. The woman, the high echelon uh, female employee who ran this unit, that did all these bad things for several years. Her name was Carrie Tolstet, T-O-L-S-T-E-D-T. Uh, she retired in July, what, two months ago? She retired, and you know what her walkaway bonus was? $124.6 million. $124.6 million, the woman who headed up all this wrongdoing. Now, if Wells Fargo can pay a fine of $185 million, pay this woman a walkaway uh, bonus of $124 million, they made a hell of a lot of money here off this situation. The only way you're going to stop it is send them to jail. You've got to arrest them. Forget the fines. And I'll tell you who the person is to lead, lead the war against them. Elizabeth Warren. You know it, and I know it. Uh, she understands the system. Uh, she'll grab them and she'll pursue them. Uh, whether she does it in the Senate as the head of a committee, if the Democrats take over the Senate, or as if Hillary wins as a secretary of something or other where she can exercise some power against the banks, that'll do it. But they are the mafia of today. Okay, I want to tell you about the column I wrote for my for Conkalife for this week that hits the, the stands tomorrow. Uh, it's titled, An American Revolutionary War Hero Who Lost His Head. An American Revolutionary War Hero Who Lost His Head. It's the story of James Warren. I suspect that many of us have never heard of James Warren. I did not hear about him till this past week. I never knew he existed. I didn't learn about him in grammar school, high school, or in any of my American history courses in college. But Joseph Warren was a big shot in the early days of the American Revolution. He was a doctor in Boston. Uh, he had important clients on both sides of the fence, so to speak, uh, coloni the colonists and the British. Uh, he, you know, he had people like Samuel Adams, John Quincy Adams, John Adams, and I don't recall who else were his patients. And he also was doctor to the governor of Massachusetts, uh, who was a Brit representative of the crown, his children. And he also took care of uh, his patient was General Gage, who was in charge of British forces in the United States. And General Gage had a wife. Her name was Margaret. She was American-born. Uh, well, Warren was a widower. Uh, he and Margaret had a relationship. They, had, they were having an affair. And uh, she also felt the British were wrong. She, she was loyal to the, the, the colonial cause. Simply stated, Margaret Gage is the one who told Joseph Warren. I didn't even know there was a Margaret Gage. I didn't know that she told Joseph Warren. She warned him that there was going to be a Lexington and Concord. Yeah. She told him, because she got this information through her husband, that the British were going to attack Lexington and arrest John Hancock and Samuel Adams. She also told him that after, Concord, after Lexington, they were going to go on to Concord to seize colonial mission, uh, munitions, which were stored 
at Concord. And do you know what else? Now, the battle's going to begin, and Paul Revere went out. Remember Paul Revere and William Dawes? You know who sent Paul Revere out and William Dawes? Paul Revere, remember? Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Joseph Warren, one of his best friends happened to be Paul Revere. He told Revere to go across the Charles River and take that route. He told William Dawes to go by land. Isn't that amazing? Joseph Warren sent Paul Revere and Dawes out, and he got the info on Lexington Concord from his girlfriend, Margaret Gage, who was wife of the British general. Okay? All this is fine. This is, But I also learned during the course of researching this column, and this was a second point I made in the column, how badly the British soldiers treated the American colonists prior to and during the Revolutionary War. Uh, Terrible, awful, awful. Atrocities all over the place, okay? And let let me give you an example, and the example will be with Warren. By the way, Joseph Warren, some historians say, was such a big man during the time he lived, he only lived to 34, though, that George Washington would have been an obscure figure in history had Warren lived. They believe he would have been the leader of the army. They believe he would have been uh, general of our army and that he would have been the first uh, president for real president of the United States. That's how strongly and involved this man was. Well, Warren was appointed and a major general in the colonial army. He should have been at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. However, there was a battle going on at Bunker Hill, and he opted to go to the battle at Bunker Hill because he thought he should fight rather than go and sit and be a political figure at that moment in time. And he went to Bunker Hill. And there were two commanding officers running the, you know, directing the colonials, running the battle for America. And they said to him, Mr. Warren, you're a general. You should lead, lead us, not us. You're the man. You're the man who's got the rank. And he says, fellas, I've never been in a war before. <laughs> I never led men like this in a war. You guys at least have had a few battles. You do it for the time being. Uh, I'll go fight as a private. I just want to go fight. Next time, I'll be the boss, but not now. I don't have the sufficient experience for this particular operation. He took a musket. He asked first of these two commanding officers, where's the worst part of the battle taking place? And they said, Breed's Hill, B-R-E-D-D, apostrophe S, Breed's Hill. So he went to Breed's Hill with his musket, and he stood in line with the farmers, the merchants who were fighting uh, the British, and there were three waves of British. There were, they were outnumbered, by the way, by the British. The first wave they kept off. They defeated the second wave. When the third wave came, uh, it was obvious that the colonials were going to be run over. They were out of ammunition. Warren himself was out of ammunition. He told the men with him to get the hell out, and they all ran back. He stood to do the best he could to give these men time to get away. All he had was his gun to whipped through the air to knock somebody on their butt. An officer came over a little hill face-to-face with Warren. The officer knew Warren. You have to understand the British hated Warren because they knew he was involved big time in screwing up the colonials. He was promoting revolution openly, giving speeches. And this officer, seeing no gun in his hand except the barrel upside down, he took his musket and shot Warren in the head. He was only a foot away, put a bullet in his forehead that came out of the back of his head. He's dead. Warren's dead. Uh, And then what does he do? He proceeds to strip Warren of his clothing. And he and his men bayoneted that body of of Warren's until he was unrecognizable. Another officer comes by and kicks Warren's body into a shallow grave where a dead farmer who was fighting for the colonists, colonies was also lying and said something to the effect, you got what you, I'm, I'm putting it in everyday language, you got what you deserve, man. Uh, you know, you're fighting us. What the hell are you, crazy? 
and screw you, you deserve this. May your principles lie with you, your seditious principles. Uh, all right. Two days later, this doesn't stop. These, this is Britain, Great Britain. Today, our friends, hard to believe, Great Britain. Two, two days later, an officer comes by intentionally, finds the grave, takes the little bit of dirt off the top, and you know what he did? He cut Warren's head off. He cut Warren's head off. Shades of Isis today. At least the guy was dead. He cut Warren's head off, and then he proceeded to do every diabolical and inhumane thing to Warren's body, that naked body which had been bayoneted. Uh, disgraceful, disgraceful situation. All right. A year later, because I, I got into uh, atrocities by the British, a year later, 200 co- colonial soldiers were at Paoli, P-A-O-L-I, Pennsylvania. They were camping overnight, 200. <laughs> They were sleeping. It's the middle of the night. British General Gates comes by. He's got 5,000 troops. It's the middle of the night. The 200 American colonists are sleeping. He tells his men, no guns, no muskets. Use your bayonets and your sabers. And what do, you, what do they do? They swarmed over those sleeping soldiers, and they killed all of them, all of them. 5,000 people against 200 bayonets, people sleeping. And those that tried to escape were stabbed or follow this, burn to death. Remember the Alamo. The cry became, from that point forward, in the Revolutionary War, remember Paoli. My column's interesting this week. Read it if you have the opportunity. I want to talk very briefly about Putin. He's a guy, Putin looks for trouble to make trouble. We're friends. For the last week or two, we're supposed to be on the same side in Syria, Russia, and the United States. Uh, We also worked out between the two of us with Syria and the other forces uh, a ceasefire. It only lasted five days. So our our jets are over there in Syria bombing someplace, and by mistake, our planes bombed and killed 62 Syrian soldiers. We're on Syria's side at this particular moment, where we should not be. Russia's our friend. They're bombing, too, and they helped helped us put together this ceasefire. The ceasefire immediately ended after five days. Everybody's back to war. And what's Russia doing? We apologize right away. We did wrong. What are you going to do? It's war. It happens. And I don't think this is the first time in the Syrian war things like this have happened with other countries and other forces. In any event, Putin says, Russia... They accuse us, the United States, of defending and fighting for ISIS, and that's why we bombed the Syrian soldiers. Russia has gone to the uh, Security Council and requested an emergency meeting to bring to the world's attention what we did. It's a stunt. Uh, Putin calls the United States killing heavy-handed, heavy-handed. And he says, and this is the word he used, the United States is conniving with the Islamic State. Uh, I mean, he reminds me of Trump. He reminds me of Donald Trump. I can't handle it. They're both crazy. They deserve each other. Uh, be that as it may, that is my show for this week. I hope you enjoyed. I enjoyed doing the show, preparing for it, and sharing my thoughts with you. I enjoy your comments. I love your comments. And I continue to say the show's getting bigger. I see the numbers every week. It's absolutely amazing that we've only been doing this, what, two years. But thank you again for joining me. I look forward to being with you next week. And I want to tell you something. I hope things tone down and it isn't as bad next week as it was this week. We're going to be talking, obviously, about the, uh, the debates Monday night, Trump and Hillary, going to be interesting. Watch it. I'll probably have some thoughts about it Tuesday night. Okay. Uh, read my blog. I write it every morning. Uh, KeyWestLou.com. It's about my life in Key West, and I share some political thoughts nationally and internationally also. You may enjoy it. You, you, you can see what Key West life is like. Thank you again for joining me. I will be with you next week.